Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for coming. I am Dan Cody. I am with the Rochester Historical Society, where I act as the collections manager and registrar. And I also teach American history out at Finger Lakes Community College and Genesee Community College. Uh, a little plug for uh, Rochester Historical Society is that we are the oldest historical organization in Western New York. We started collecting the stories of Rochester in 1861. Uh, but then the Civil War got in the way and people had more important things to do. But then Mrs. Carolyn Perkins picked it up again in 1870 and we've been collecting the stories of Rochester ever since. So to get our minds back into uh, the past a little bit, I uh, put um, this uh, slide up because uh, I'm uh, kind of into old cars and it's a story of Rochester that a lot of us don't remember or don't even know is that we used to make cars here in Rochester and we used to make very, very nice cars in Rochester, um, specifically the Cunningham car. Um, they were made over on Canal Street, just around the corner off of West Main. Um, the Cunningham family had been in Rochester for uh, generations. Their claim to fame was that they made uh, very luxurious carriages and funeral hearses. Uh, but then when the automobile came along and it was here to stay, uh, the Cunningham family decided that they would retool their factories and make automobiles. So they started making cars in 1908 and they made them up until 1932. And their claim to fame was their cars were very luxurious. They were all handmade. Um, the, he put the same kind of quality and craftsmanship into his automobiles as he did to his carriages and funeral hearses. Um, this one is a kind of appropriate for today's talk is this one is a 1917 Cunningham. It's a, what they called a boat tail roadster. And if you look closely at the back, the back of it um, tapers down a little bit, much like the stern of, of a boat would. Um, if you would like to see one of these cars, you can go on YouTube because Jay Leno, uh, you know, he collects cars. He has about 400 cars in his collection. He actually has two Cunningham cars that were made right here in Rochester. He has a 1925 and a 1927 um, sedan. So if you're interested in actually seeing one run on the road, that's it. But today what we're going to do is talk about something that's kind of appropriate for this time period because we are in the centennial of the Great War. Um, and the Great War is uh, a war that was kind of forgotten a little bit. Um, but Rochester played a very vital role in the war effort. So today, what we're gonna do is talk about mobilizing Rochester during the Great War. So what we should do is put our minds back into 1917 and just find out what Rochester was like in 1917. Our population was 240,000, a little bit bigger than what we are today. Um, our mayor was the very uh, popular Hiram Edgerton and he made the whopping salary of $5,000 a year. Our chief of police was Joseph Quigley, who made $3,500 a year, and that salary was matched by the, the uh, fire chief, Charles Little. And you have to remember too, this is 1917. Um, a lot of the fire suppression in the city was still horse-drawn, so the fire department had their own vet and Dr. George made $1,300 a year. Uh, railroads were the mass transit of the day. There were 19 railroad companies that served Rochester, and you could pick up a train at any of the 11 stations that were scattered throughout the city. Um, Rochester has always been, and hopefully will continue, to be a destination city, meaning people came here to get good jobs, good, well-paying jobs, and then they stayed here and raised their families here. So that um, our school system was quite large. There were 43 grammar schools and two high schools. So I know some of you are thinking, well, where are all those kids going to? Those high schools had to be huge. Well, you have to again remember this is 1917. Grammar schools went up to eighth grade. There was nothing like, like what we used to call junior high or they call middle school these days. There was nothing like that then. Um, you went to school until about eighth grade, and then a lot of kids went out and got jobs when they uh, graduated from the eighth grade. So there was only a population 
that would be served by two high schools. Uh, coal was the power of the day. Uh, 96 uh, retail coal dealerships uh, that were supplied by 16 different retail uh, wholesale coal distributors. We were a very literate city. Uh, there were six English newspapers uh, that were printed daily, and these newspapers had multiple editions. They would be the, sun, the sunrise edition, the morning edition, the noon edition. So the news was constantly being updated. Um, if you were sick in Rochester, there were five hospitals that would take care of you. Um, and another claim to fame that Rochester has is that we are the city that has had minor league baseball longer than any other city um, in the nation. And I'm a big Red Wings fan, so I, uh, I put this in there. That during 1917, our baseball team was the Rochester Hustlers, and they were in the International Double A League at the time. We were a very spiritual city. 25 Roman Catholic churches, 88 Protestant churches scattered throughout the city. We had a very large Jewish population that was served by tw uh, 12 synagogues. And Rochester was broken up into ethnic neighborhoods. There was the old Polish neighborhood, the old German neighborhood, the Italian neighborhood. We, because we were a destination for immigrants to come to Rochester uh, to get a good job. And Rochester at the time was definitely an American uh, melting pot. What kind of jobs did you do when you came to, to Rochester? Well, any time after 1880, you can't talk about Rochester without talking about the Eastman Kodak Company. So of course, there was photography and lots and lots of machining and tooling, fine instrument making, very high skilled jobs were here. Of course, I know, uh, mentioned earlier, we make automobiles, heavy machinery, Lots of breweries in the town. We had meat processing in the town, and packaging and chemicals that were a byproduct, actually, of the Eastman Kodak Company. But Rochester, being a very literate city, we knew what was going on in the world, and we knew the war in Europe broke out in August of 1914. And we need to take a notice of the Belgian situation for just for a moment because it was the, the violation of Belgian sovereignty by Imperial Germany that really caused this conflagration to become a world war because Belgian sovereignty, their neutrality, had been guaranteed by um, a treaty. So when Germany invaded Belgium on their way to France, in fact, the Kaiser wrote a letter to the king of Belgium and said, oh, we'd just like to march through your country, please. And the king wrote back, uh, no, you can't. And then the Kaiser said, well, well, we'll pay for any damage that we do. And he still said, you know, the king still said no, so that really gets the, the Kaiser mad, so he go goes anyways, violating Belgian neutrality. Because of the treaty, that brings in Great Britain. And Great Britain at the time is the largest empire in the world with the largest navy in the world, which is going to be critical during the war. However, America was not dragged into the war because we did not have a treaty with anyone in Europe. So we weren't dragged into the war at the get-go. In fact, President Wilson, right from the beginning, declares American neutrality. However, as the war goes in for the first few months, there are people that are a little bit worried that we might get dragged into it. So the United States Council of National Defense is created, and Rochester and other American industries all start to kind of know which, which everybody is doing a little bit, to just be more aware of it in case uh, we do get dragged into the war. However, being neutral, by definition, we could still do business with both sides. Although we do most of our business with, uh, with, the, al with the allies because of more cu cultural connections. Um, but we start to satisfy the needs of the allies very quickly. Kodak, of course, the photographic equipment, chemicals and filters, and camouflage research. Now we think of camouflage in the military almost simultaneously these days. But we have to remember this is 1917. In 1914, 
when the French marched off to war, they marched off in these beautiful bright blue coats, bright red pants, and bright white canvas hats. Well, they became very good targets very, very quickly. So there was this idea of, well, maybe we should hide a little bit and uh, blend in with the background. So Kodak starts to doing uh, camouflage research. Bausch and Lohm, the, the Great War is what makes Bausch and Lohm a player on the world stage. Because the best optics prior to the Great War were made in Germany, by far. American manufacturers were a, a second distant. But now the Germans are the enemy. We can't buy from them. The Allies can't buy from them. So the Allies, being the French and the British, turned to Bausch and Lohm um, for all of their optical equipment. General Railway Signal over on West Avenue produces artillery shells for the British. I brought a, a sample along from our collections. I'll show it to you after uh, the lecture. And the Symington Company, right across the street from GRS, also makes artillery shells for the British. And there's a lot of community groups in the Rochester area that start doing work um, for the supporting the civilians uh, that are being the victims of, of the war in Europe. The Daughters of the American Revolution. Uh, they were the first organization in Rochester to send supplies to the, to the Belgians, clothing and blankets and, and food. Uh, in 1916, loaned their house for the training of home nursing aides. Uh, the Red Cross. The Red Cross in Rochester was phenomenal dur during the Great War. In fact, uh, we were the second chapter of the American Red Cross that was organized in the country. Um, and, we, and they solicited contributions of food, clothing, and, and money to send for the Belgian relief. And what was very unique was they uh, had this program where they cut and wrapped bandages and surgical dressings for military uses. Because the militaries of the day didn't have the medical infrastructure that we associate with today. Um, it was really kind of this haphazard, um, and they really re relied on civilian support for this. And I brought some examples of the types of bandages that they cut and wrapped here in Rochester. The Rochester National Defense Contingent, this was like what we would call our reserves of today. Uh, they were young men that had job, regular jobs during the week, but on the weekends they gathered um, and they prepared for war and they learned how to do military drills, small arms drills, marching drills, um, just in case that we were dragged into the war. Because our military at the beginning of the Great War was the 17th largest in the world. The country of Romania had a bigger army than the United States of America at the time. But these young men who had did practice on their weekends once we got into the war, they were the ones that became a lot of the uh, non-commissioned officers right from the get-go as we were building our army to send to France. Well, for a number of reasons, the United States does get dragged into the war. Um, President Wilson goes to Congress and asks Congress for a declaration of war. Uh, according to our Constitution, only the Congress can declare war, so the President has to go and ask. Um, so we did declare war on April 6, 1917. But what was unique is now America, and of course, including Rochester, what we do is we downshift all of our social programs and our economy, we downshift them into a war economy, a total war. President Wilson comes out and says it's just not the American military that is going to war, that it's the American people that are going to, to war. So it's this total war mentality. So now Rochester has to mobilize for the war. Something that's very unique that comes out of the Great War is the draft. Like I said earlier, we had a tiny, tiny little army. We needed the young men to fill, fill the army. So um, there was a registration day, which was June 5th, 1917. To almost 28,000 men register in Rochester. And it's very, very unique, because think of it, it's 1917. If the federal government wants to know where you live right now, how would they do that? Your driver's license? 1917, there were no driver's licenses. Your social security? Social security doesn't come up for another 20 years. 
you know, there was no programs. These 28,000 young men showed up and registered on the honor system because it was the right thing to do. Um, when they showed up, they gave their name, their date of birth, where they lived, and their occupation. And we'll get into that a little bit later. Um, so that was the registration for it. Uh, the actual draft happens um, just about two weeks later. And there are eight young men in Rochester that get that first number. And they're very proud that they got that first number. Um, there was a quota system set up. The government figured out that for a population of X, so many of that X would be draft age young men. So that's how they based their, their quotas on. And Rochester very quickly filled their, their quota um, because there was already, we already included the men that were in the military prior to the draft. Uh, and of course, uh, once you get drafted, you have to go get your medical exams. It happened in August. And then on September 6th, there is this big celebration down at the train station where the, four, the first 48 of the young men that go off to war from Rochester uh, go on the trains off to basic training. And there's bands that are playing down there. The mayor goes down there and gives a, gives a speech. It's this big patriotic um, event. We fulfill our duties very, very quickly. Uh, September 9th, uh, 417 more men leave, and it's going to be a constant filling of the, the pipeline of the young men that are needed. Um, November 9th, um, when the last five men, just um, two days before the armistice, the last five men go for naval training. And this is unique down there on the, on the bottom. Of all the men from Rochester serving, only 50% of them had to be drafted, which was contrary to the national um, average of a city our size, where in order to meet their quotas, they had to draft 70%. So if you turn those numbers around, we were a very, very patriotic city. We only had to draft 50% of the men that were needed. Of the registrations, there were about 69,000 of them, but they had deferments. Deferments means you didn't have to go in and join the, um, the service. We'll start at the bottom and work our way up. There were 84 agricultural deferments. Now, I told you earlier when you signed up, you, one of the things you told was your name, your age, your, ex, your address, and your occupation. Well, if you were a farmer, <coughs> That was going to be your job during the war. It was your job to stay home on the farm and raise the crops and take care of the livestock. Because as Napoleon famously said once, is that an army marches on its stomach, you had to be able to feed the troops and, of course, keep food going to the civilians. There were about 1,200 industrial deferments. These were the young men that had a job that was directly linked to, to, to the war effort. Such as if you were a lens maker at Bausch and Lohm, you, got a, you had an occupational deferment because your job at the factory was going to be your contribution to the war effort. And then there were almost 12,000 dependency uh, deferments because again, remember this is 1917. There is no s social safety net. There's no social security. There is no federal programs to help. Um, so let's say if you're a, a young man and you've got a wife and seven kids, you go off to war, who's going to take care of your wife and those seven kids? They didn't want them to become a ward of the state because the state didn't have the money, the programs to take care of them. Or the other side of the demographics also. If you were a young man and you were the sole source of support for elderly parents or elderly relatives, it was again your job to stay home and take care of them so that your family members didn't become a burden to the state and then therefore a burden to the war effort. Uh, the Rochester Red Cross, like I said before, was very instrumental in the, in the great war efforts of Rochester. Um, we had operational offices over at the Hotel Rochester, but it was so popular and there was so much to do that they needed the workspace uh, 
So the workrooms were over at the Hotel Seneca. And what did they do? They trained volunteers and they were contributing equipment and soliciting equipment for hospital base number 19, which we'll get to in a few minutes. Um, like I said earlier, they cut and wrapped surgical dressing and garments. Collecting fruit pits for filters, kind of unique. The Great War was the first war that they used poison gas in. The French came up with an idea of have, making gas masks to filter out the poison gas. Well, they fi quickly found out that if they took basically peach pits, or what they would call stone pits, pits from peaches, cherries, apricots, that type of fruit, if you grabbed, you collected those, and then you baked them and made them into a charcoal, it was that pro product then that would be put into the filters that would filter out the poison gas on the battlefields. And I brought a, a, a gas mask that was actually used by um, um, a young man from Rochester, and you can see the container um, that contains the uh, peach pit material. And here in Rochester, because of the surrounding areas where a lot of, I live in Webster now, and during 1917, Webster was just really one big apple orchard, you know. Um, but the surrounding areas, we were a very bountiful uh, agricultural area, so it was very easy for us to gather these uh, stone pits. Um, and what we, uh, the Rochester Red Cross also did was help support the soldiers in transit. There's a photograph of uh, volunteers from the Red Cross cutting and wrapping bandages. Um, and they provided classes to the community also. Dietetic classes, again, because they wanted to do was to, uh, to conserve food and get the most out of the food that they could. Uh, first aid classes for the Daughters of American Revolution. Conservation at the convention hall, where, where Jiva is now. Um, the Rochester Red Cross chapter trained and sent 50 nurses overseas and 250 nursing aides overseas. And this was very unique because this is 1917 and the sphere of influence for women basically was still at home. It was still the end of the, of the Victorian age. So now these women going off into a war zone and taking care of men that are not family members is something new that's, break, that's breaking out. Um, and we had a home service division which kind of looked after the families of the servicemen. They would be the people that would, oh, maybe they heard that Mrs. Smith down the road isn't doing too well and her son is off to war. Well, what the member of the Home Service Division would do would be finding uh, organizations like in the neighborhood that could help out Mrs. Smith a little bit. Like go to the local church to see, well, maybe may, you have a, you know, a soup kitchen or a food program going on there. And they would coordinate those things just to help out because, again, there is no infrastructure for a social safety net at the time. The Red Cross had a canteen committee, and what they did is they met every single troop train that came through Rochester uh, every day from 7 a.m. to 10 p.m. And Rochester, like I told you before, had a lot of train tracks going through it, and we were a transportation hub, taking the men from the Midwest, the Ohio Valley, taking them to the uh, Chicago training grounds and then shipping them to Boston and New York City to get on the ships to go to France. The train tracks, many, many train tracks went through Rochester. So Rochester was a layover a lot of the times. And what did they do is they handed out creature comforts, gum and candy and maybe some writing material to, to write home with, a sandwich and a hot cup of coffee. However, this is 1917. And it's still a very sad time in the history of our country because our country is segregated by law. As of 1896, Plessy versus Ferguson, it's separate but equal between the races. So the African American community in Rochester had to take care of their own. So they created the Dunbar Red Cross Auxiliary and they did the exact same thing for the black troop trains. And there's a famous photograph of uh, black African-Americans in the Red Cross taking care of them 
because the troop trains were, seg were segregated. The troops were segregated in all aspects uh, during the war. Uh, as a matter of fact, the American military does not become desegregated until 1948 by presidential de decree, after the Second World War. There was a mansion over on East Avenue that was donated to the Red Cross, and it became known as the Red Cross House. And what did they do in there? The war is being fought in Northeast France, and it gets cold there. So they needed warm clothes, so they make these knitting machines. They put these knitting machines up there to knit massive amounts of materials and 50 sewing machines. In Rochester's chapter of the Red Cross, yes? Everything was segregated, yes. So the knitting for the white shirts was knitting for the black shirts? You didn't know where it went. When it went to the army, then it was segregated. Yes. Good question. But Rochester's chapter is one of the largest producers of knitted materials during the war effort. Everybody gets involved some way or the other. And I love showing this photograph. These are three of Rochester's finest. They are Rochester firefighters. They, because of their occupation, they got a deferment from going off to war, but they still want to do their, their efforts, their patriotic duty. So I'm a member of the West Webster Fire Department. I've been there 27 years, and they never taught me how to knit. But I could crank a, crank a handle on a machine just like these young men are doing. And that's what they did. Everybody was getting involved in the uh, war effort. Uh, because the trains of the time were not air conditioned like they are today, they were hot and dirty and they were coal fired, so there was, you know, there was, there was a lot of soot and dirt, dirt being transported on these for days at a time. You got hot and sweaty and smelly. So the Rochester Red Cross built a bathhouse on Central Avenue. It went, between, it went between Joseph Avenue and St. Paul Street, just along Ward Street. Um, and about over 50,000 troops used this facility when it was available to them. And there's a photograph of it. And it's nothing fancy. It was just made out of plywood. But still, it was an, a, a, a chance for the soldiers to get off the train, to go take a shower, feel a little bit. I mean, you know, we all feel better when you take a shower. You feel like a million bucks afterwards. Um, so it was another creature comfort for the soldiers going off to war. I mentioned earlier hospital base number 19. What that was was a lot of us will remember the TV show MASH, uh, Mobile Army Surgical Hospital. Well, it was like that. It was uh, organized by Dr. John Swan, who was an internist over at RGH. Um, and he talked 22 doctors from RGH to, to join up with him and two Rochester dentists. He also convinced um, a Rochester minister to become the hospital ch uh, chaplain. And there was $25,000 of equipment that was donated by Rochester. $25,000 of 1917 dollars. That's a, that's a lot. And $9,000 in cash was donated by the citizens of Rochester to buy other materials that were needed. Um, the hospital was established in Vichy, France on June 19, 1918, and it closed six months later on December 19. It was a very busy place, uh, a little over 11,000 patients, but in one day, there were 822 admissions. So it was a very, very busy place. And it was a very, these do doctors really knew their stuff. Of those patients, there were only 78 deaths. So if you do the, you do the math, it's about a 0.7% mortality rate. But it is, this was the soldiers that lived long enough to make it back to the hospital. Yes. Uh, to the it was about 60 miles from the front. The women of Rochester were unique. Um, women throughout history have always been in the back seat 
but um, if it hadn't been for the women of Rochester, uh, things might would have been very, very different. And I just have some highlights here of some, of some ladies who uh, stepped to the front and uh, did what was needed. Uh, Mrs. Helen Eli of East Avenue, she found the Rochester chapter of the Surgical Dressing Committee, which I brought some um, examples of her work. And she talked over 2,000 women into donating their time. Come into the city, give me an hour if you can, give me three hours if you can, whatever you can give is, is great. And over 2,000 women participated in her program. Mrs. Lucius Button, uh, was the founder of the Rochester branch of American Fund for the French. Right from the get-go, before we were even involved in the war, the Rochester women were doing uh, their huma human humanities part um, for the war effort. And then Mrs. Sherman's Clark, which I brought some of her um, artifacts, she was the founder of the Rochester chapter for the movement of national preparedness. One of these ones that would said, you know, if we're going to get dragged into this war, we might as well hit the ground running. So let's just start uh, thinking about it a little bit. The women promoted the purchase of Liberty Bonds, and we'll get into that in, uh, in a few minutes. Uh, the women were very involved in the draft registration process. Uh, more than half the members of the local uh, <coughs> draft boards were women, and all eight boards had women as chief clerks. Uh, Helen Neller was the first female recruiter. Well, her husband was the marine recruiter, and what she did was she would walk up and down Main Street and um, find young men that were not in uniform, and she would like harass them <laughs> to uh, go and see her husband, uh, because, you know, what are you doing? Because the worst thing you could be called during the Great War was a slacker. And a slacker was somebody who was doing nothing in the war effort, nothing. Uh, Bertha Eldridge was the first female four-minute man. And what these four-minute people did was they had this little patriotic spiel that took about four minutes to give, and it was about to enlist, conserve, and invest in the war effort. And they would be any place where a group of people would con uh, congregate, let's say at at the streetcar um, stops, or at the gates of factories where there would be a lot of workers com coming in and going, uh, downtown on street corners. Uh, the women moved into all of these jobs that were left empty with the young men going off to war. Um, so they went into the factories for the first time in large numbers. Um, here in Rochester, there were quite a few women running the public transportation running the streetcars. Uh, they were delivering freight, they became mechanics, and it was actually during the Great War that the first female professor at the U of R started. Good question. It'll come to me. I'll get back to you on it. This is a photograph of one of the four minute w w women making their, their spiel. Um, and, but it's interesting is that in the foreground you can see there's soldiers standing there. Well, in the background there are young men that are not, in, not, and you can bet your bottom dollar that she is pointing out to the men that are not in uniform, the men that are in uniform, and she is trying to um, embarrass them into, do, into join, joining up. They were very, very effective. It's about 75 businesses in Rochester reported significant um, production into the war effort. Uh, and then after the war, they did a, an analysis that 60% of Rochester's industrial output during the war years was for the war effort. So what did we make? We made munitions and machinery and photography. And we'll get into that in a minute freight cars and engines, anything that we made here in Rochester that could be used for the war effort went into the war effort. And there were some businesses that retooled their factories in order to make war munitions. Some of the examples were railway, general railway signal. They made the shell casings and machine screw parts. 
Strongberg Carlson here in Rochester. We used to make telephones in Rochester. 85% of their production was into the war effort. And I actually brought a phone, a field phone, um, that was made in Rochester, uh, found on a f battlefield in northeast France, and then brought back to Rochester uh, by a ro uh, young man from Rochester. Gleason Works made machine tools, and the gearing, the special gear cutting machines that they're famous for, in order to help make, because this was the first really mechanized war um, that, um, that uh, the world fought. And the Selden Motor Company, um, over on University Avenue, their claim to fame was they made what was referred to as Liberty Trucks, but we would refer to them today as pickup trucks, something that was very unique that had a military driving behind it. Symington, we talked about them earlier. They made shrapnel shells, um, and I brought some shrapnel, and we'll talk about that in, in a minute. Um, and then Rochester Gas and Electric. Well, you think, Rochester Gas and Electric, they make gas and electric. What can they do for the war effort? Well, remember, this is the days where they were burning coal to create electric, to make, create steam. The city was powered by steam. The city was heated by steam. So there was byproducts from burning coal. Um, and so, um, the coal gas plant of rg and &E produced 100,000 tons of coke, which is a byproduct of burning, burning coal, and the different tars, over a million gallons. And the ammonia, there were 800, over 815,000 pounds of it. Now these, the, these materials here would go to be used by other companies that would make then make parts or things that went into the war. So it didn't have to be an end product that a soldier would actually touch, you know, the ammonia. The ammonia was used in the making of explosives and munitions. So, po Rochester was at all levels of the logistic supply chain for the Great War. We talked about Bausch and Lomb earlier. 40,000 pounds of optical glass per month. They made lenses and optical instruments for any type of fire control air and naval navigation, aerial photography that we'll get into in a, in a minute, searchlights and trench periscopes. We used to make trench periscopes right here on uh, West Main Street uh, with Bausch and Lomb mirrors and lenses on them. And all it was is, you know, there was a trench war. So you didn't want to stick your head above the trench, but you would stick your periscope up there to see, to see where the enemy was. Um, and once war was declared in April of 1917, 100% of the production at Bausch & Lomb went into the war effort. We were very unique during the Great War. We were the first and only school of aerial photography in the world. It was a joint venture between the United States Army Signal Corps Company and Eastman Kodak Company. What they were doing is they were blending photography with newfangled airplanes. Because what they were doing was they were, because it was trench warfares, they wanted to see where the enemy was, they wanted to see where the trenches were, and then they wanted to see if there were soldiers in the trenches. So they would fly up above enemy territory, hang out, take pictures, come back, develop the film, and give it to the military within 24 hours so that they could create new and up-to-date maps. And I brought a map from our collection that actually shows uh, the information on how it, was, how it was updated. So, where was it? It was over at Kodak Park in Building 50. They had the entire fourth floor. And their job over there was to design and manufacture handheld, and then at the, towards the end, they had these automatic cameras and their film. And there was special film that had to be made because they were high up, not as real high, but high for 1918, and they were moving. So it had to be different kind of film, and then with that different film, they had to have different developing processes. So as they were making them, they were um, cr creating new ones and tra trademarking them, as you can see, the Hawkeye and the aerial cameras, um, the different development equipment, because it had to be done quickly and in the field. They couldn't send it someplace they had to do it right there where they, uh, actually, they did them in the hangars 
where the uh, airplanes would land after the reconnaissance missions. The soldiers were trained two things. Is one, how to take the photograph, and two, how to fix the camera if it, uh, if it broke. Doesn't do you any good to have all this film and all these cameras if they break and you can't fix them. There were just about 2,100 soldier students um, at the school, and the school was only open for nine and a half months because the war quickly ended, abruptly ended. And there's a photograph of the soldiers doing their soldier thing. They're marching and out in formation over at Kodak Park. And if you look in the background there, you can see the grandstands. They are doing their marching on the baseball field over at Kodak Park. And I like showing this one because it really reflects the time of the, of the times of 1917. When I teach my students to look at a photograph, of course, it's going to show you what it shows you. But what, who is it not showing you? <clears throat> who is not in that photograph? Women and, people of color. Women and people of color, very good, yes. It was still very much a, a world of white men. But these men were the um, faculty of the school that George Eastman told them, your job is to do whatever the government needs to get this job done. And there were other organizations in Rochester that stepped up to the plate to help out as much as they could. The YMCA, very so, it's similar to what it do does now, but during the war it gave out meals and there was lodgings, a place to relax, and maybe if you had a layover for your train, you'd go down to the, to the Y and they'd give you a pen and a piece of paper, you could write home to mom, you know. Arrive safe in Rochester, we'll write soon, you know, something that all young men do or our mothers do want the young men to do. The YMCA is a Protestant organization, so the Catholics couldn't be outdone, so they didn't have the infrastructure, the brick and mortar, but they had the organization. And they, in their organization, the Knights of Columbus, they raised money and they purchased these creature comforts that places like the Red Cross would hand out to the, to the soldiers uh, when they came through the, tra the trains um, in Rochester. The Jewish Military Welfare Society was very, very unique. They provided a farewell celebrations, and about 500, oh, 500 families signed up because they were adamant in their thought that no Jewish soldier should go off to war by himself or come home from war by himself. There was always a congregation from this organization to meet every Jewish soldier. And if there was a layover during the Jewish high holidays, they would invite them into their homes to have um, a home-cooked meal and to participate in their religious acti activities. The Daughters of, um, of the American Revolution, they helped um, coordinate and collect supplies for a hospital base 19. They knitted sweaters and mittens, and they had dances for the soldiers on their, lay on their layovers and such. It's to, again, get the young men's mind off of what was ahead of them. Mechanics Institute. We know it today as RIT, but it was downtown during, during the Great War. And in December of 1917, the directors placed the entire school at the disposal of the federal government. May of 1918, the War Department contracts with the school to teach soldiers the basic trades, because not every soldier has to carry a gun. There are soldiers Soldiers need places to live, so you have to have carpenters and plumbers and electricians. Soldiers need to be transported, so you need, need to have mechanics and drivers. They need to have trained uh, personnel to know how to maintain the trains to move not only the soldiers, but all the material that was needed for the war. So they taught, they taught them these, these things. And they had other war effort programs as well that taught the the civilians, conservation of food, how to conserve food, how to, a big thing of, during the war was to dehydrate food. When I was doing the research uh, for this, uh, like I told you, I live in Webster, and during the Great War, Webster, New York, was the dried apple capital of the world. They sent out more dried apple than um, anybody, anybody else. And what they did was they tried to, get the civilian population to contribute as much as they could 
to producing products for the war, and at the same time to educate the po population to use as less as possible for what they needed. Because the mantra then was, we're going to do with a little less so our boys in France can have a little bit more. But the rest of Rochester, everybody jumped in here. The Rochester Municipal Coal Bureau, what they did was, there was no rationing during the Great War. Rationing would only come during the Second World War. But what this organization did was they kind of reached out and talked to all of those different coal dealers that I talked about earlier. And what they were doing was they were trying to prohibit somebody from hoarding coal. They were trying to prohibit me from calling company A and say, hey, could you deliver a half a ton to my backyard? And then calling company B, hey, could you deliver a half ton to my backyard? And doing like that. They coordinated that so that there would be enough coal for everyone, so nobody did without. <laughs> my wife loves this. My wife is a respiratory therapist, so she takes care of people who have damaged lungs. But cigarettes at the time were thought to be healthy. They calmed you down. They helped with digestion. So when you went to buy a pack of cigarettes, you bought a pack for yourself, and you'd buy a pack, and you'd put it in a barrel, and they would send them off to the, to the soldiers. Books and magazine drives here at the libraries. Uh, people would collect books because trench warfare was, was described as 95% boredom and then 5% total terror. So during that 95% time, you gave them something to do, gave them some reading, get their, their minds off of it. Uh, scrap drives were very big, metal, glass, and paper. Victory gardens. Again, this idea of doing less so the boys could have more. Victory gardens were when you grew your own fruits and vegetables in your backyard. A couple of reasons for this. One was that the, the um, agricultural industry, instead of supplying food to, the, let's say, the civilians of Rochester, they could take that food and put it towards the war effort. And if there was less demand for food being transported between farms and cities, there would be more room on the trains for war materials such as munitions and soldiers. So people grew it in their backyards, and it would become something that they could do. It was part of their patriotic participations. Um, like I said, we were doing with less so our boys would have more. And there's um, a photograph of two Victory Gardens. One is a school over on Post Avenue, school number 37. And you can see the students are out there in their play fields, and they're using part of it. They made it into a garden to grow their uh, own vegetables. Uh, but then you don't have to be in grammar school to do it. And on the bottom, you can see some uh, senior citizens from Rochester. And it looks like it's just a typical city backyard. You know, so they were using their backyard to grow their own fruits and vegetables, still doing their patriotic duty. The children got into it, and the children got into it because it was a game. They made it because it was a total war effort. They wanted to get the children involved in, into it, so they made a game out of it. So let's say they're going to collect, like in the photograph there, they're collecting paper. So let's say Mrs. Smith's class is going to challenge Mrs. Clark's class across the hall to see who can collect the most paper. And then it's going to be school 38 against school 42. So it's going to be a competition. It'll be fun for the kids to get out there. And it's getting something done because they needed that for the ma material for the war effort. But if the children are doing it, that means adults don't have to do it and they can be doing something else. Photograph of collecting books and magazines for our soldiers. Believe it or not, the government does not have enough money to wage war. They have to borrow money. So who do they borrow money from? They borrow money from us. There were five separate bond drives in Rochester from right after the war started in 17 to May 9th, 1919. Well, some of you are going to say, well, the war ended in November of 1918. Why did you have another bond drive in May? You still had to pay the bills. Four-minute men and women would help to support and promote bond sales. And they used a lot of gimmicks. Um, there was an arch over Main Street. And if you bought a Liberty bond, 
you got to go up in the arch, and in the middle of Main Street in this arch was a, a Liberty Bell, and you got to ring the Liberty Bell. Um, in Rochester, we raised $126 million um, in bonds, which is a lot of money, and our war savings stamps, we raised about $3 million. And war stamps were different. War stamps were smaller denominations so that everyone in the social economic um, structure of society could buy them. They were smaller. And a lot of us will remember the S&H green stamps, you know, you used to get and lick them and put them in the book. Well, you could do the same thing with these war saving stamps is that you would, buy, you would buy them, fill up your book, and then your book you could turn in for a war bond because the bonds made interest. You bought them for $18.75 and then 10 years they gave you $25 back. But the saving stamps did not make interest so you would convert them into a bond. And here's one of the gimmicks. This is, as you can see, it is a carriage that's ca carrying Kaiser Bill's coffin. One of the gimmicks was that for a dollar, you could nail, hammer a nail into the top of the Kaiser's casket. Well, this photograph here is on the corner of Exchange Street and State Street, and they're on their way to Mount Hope Cemetery. The top is nailed very, very tightly. So what are they gonna do now? They're gonna go to Mount Hope Cemetery and there's gonna be another gimmick there. At the graveside, you'll, for a dollar, you'll be able to throw a shovel full of dirt onto the Kaiser's casket in the ground. Another, another gimmick to make uh, money for the, for the government. And this is James Byron. And James Byron was just a, you know, a common man. He did everything that he could. He worked for, he was a four minute man on all five of the drives. He was a lawyer, so he used his skill set to help the war effort. He worked in the Home Defense League, the Legal Advisory Board, and more importantly, the soldiers' welfare work. What he would do is he would use his skill set as a lawyer that if there was a soldier's family that was having legal issues, Let's say the pay isn't coming home. You know, I still have my wife and my kids to feed. If they're not coming home, Mr. Mr. Byron would help that out, and this was all pro bono work. So everybody did their work. They did what they could with the skill sets that they had. So in conclusion, Rochester, New York definitely answered its call to the colors. We supplied money, material, men, and women. We sent over 18,000 men to war, and unfortunately, 512 of them didn't come home. Rochester, New York, definitely a patriotic city during the Great War. So, thank you. So, like I said, I teach American history, and I teach it to freshmen, and they have to take my class, so they go, oh, another history class. You know, boring, I'm gonna, have to, I'm gonna have to memorize names of generals and how many bullets were shot. Well, I don't teach it that way. I put it, a human face on it. Because, especially when you're talking about wars and then I'm teaching freshmen, that's the age group that goes. So I try to put a human face on it. Remember I, I, I started talking about how the French went off to war and their beautiful uh, bright blue coat, bright red pants and those white canvas helmets? Well, very quickly, at the end of, of 1914, the war becomes a stalemate, and they dig in, and it's trench warfare. Well, if your enemy is in the trenches, and they're not putting their heads above ground, you have to get them from the top. So shrapnel becomes the key weapon to use. And shrapnel, for those of you who don't know it, is a shell that goes up in the air, and at a certain time, or a certain elevation above the ground, it explodes and it explodes into many pieces of razor-sharp steel that rains down on the men that are hiding in the trenches at about 9,000 miles an hour. So, and I'm gonna drop these, don't make noise. 9,000 miles an hour coming at your head. And the only thing you have on your head is those white canvas hats. It's not gonna stop a lot of shrapnel. 
So very quickly, they came up with steel helmets. And we used to make these steel helmets in, in Rochester because we had the industrial might to do it, and they were very ma easy to make. They were just one quick stamping. You know, the flat sheet would go through the machine, you'd punch, hit, pu hit the punch press, it would punch it. And this is, was worn by a, a Rochesterian who, who went, off to, went off to war. Um, in Rochester, over at GRS, um, we used to make I say we because I actually, when I first got out of college the first time, I worked at GRS, um, and you could, they still had the old um, uh, molds for, for these, um, the tooling for these. Um, these were the casings. Now, they would make the casings, but they would not arm them in Rochester. They would send these over by the hundreds of thousands to, to England, and then they would be armed in England. Um, I talked about the women of Rochester and uh, the Red Cross cutting and wrapping bandages. Well, when you wrote to the national organization and said you wanted to start a chapter in Rochester or wherever your hometown was, they sent back written instructions on how to do it. Because the, the infrastructure of the medical service in the military at the time was not as as uniform as it is now. And there wasn't as much of it as there now. So what they were trying to do was to get all of these volunteer organizations to make everything uniform. So they had written instructions. So they would tell you to take you know, the gauze and fold it four times, or rolls of gauze. You know, and they knew that every one of these rolls of gauze was going to be 15 yards long, so that they knew what they were getting when they were when a doctor or a nurse would grab it, they knew what they had, and it was much easier for them to order it and maintain it and to stock it if they always knew what everything was. If I could look at that, I can look at it and know that's 15 yards of, of two inch gauze. So, they would make bandages also. This one, this one is unique. This one is actually called, they refer to them as donuts. Well, its actual name is an elbow donut to protect your elbow. You know, if you would put it, if you broke your elbow, you would, would protect the, the broken joint this way. But once um, poison gas was starting to be used very, very um, frequently, um, if the gas didn't kill you, one of the side effects did it is it blinded you and it did damage to the soft tissue around your eyes. And what they would have is they would have the salve that they would put on their eyes. And they couldn't, they couldn't be, um, um, couldn't be touched or, or, or disturbed. So what they would do is they had, came up with a new idea of these: is they would put them on their eyes, and then they would use a what was what we call a uh, Civil War bandage, just wrap it around your head. So now this was protecting the eye, nothing over the eye, but they would protect the eye. And I'm sure a lot of you have seen that very famous photograph of the, the long line of soldiers and they're standing in line and they have their hands on the, so on the shoulder of the soldier in front of them. All of those soldiers are blind because of the poison gas. So they're on their way to the, to the first aid station and uh, perhaps be um, treated with one of these. We talked about knitting. Well, you could knit on one of those machines or you could knit by hand if you had that skill set. So what they would do is they would send written, written um, instructions along with the material, or you could su su um, supply your own material, and it would give you the written instructions. And this one, again, is an eye bandage um, that it would be put on, it would be put on like this with the, with the uh, salve underneath to protect their eyes. We're talking about poison gas. This is a, a gas mask that was used by a Rochesterian, and, and, he, and he brought it home with him. When you come up and look at it, you can see the yellow container that has the peach pit. But the French were the first ones that came up with the uh, idea of gas masks. And the French ones were, they were in a, in, in a cylinder. And they wore the cylinder with a sash over his shoulder and it hung on their hip. Well, at the scream of gas, they would be fumbling around over here trying to put it on, and sometimes 
It only takes one inhalation of poison gas and you're done. So the Americans learned from the French and the English because they had been at, French and the English had been at war for almost three years before we got into it. So Americans never went into battle without a steel helmet on. You'll see pictures of them with their khakis hats on, but they are not in a war zone. They're either marching they're, or they're back in an R&R &R zone. We learned from the French and the English mistakes. We also learned from that fumbling. Americans wore their gas mask on their chest like this. Because at the scream of gas, instead of fumbling over here, it's wiggling back and forth, at the scream of gas, all you do is open it and it's on your face very, very, very quickly. In our collection, we have a letter from a young man who's writing home to his mother here in Rochester. And he states that he loves his gas mask. Not that it saved his life during a gas attack, but it saved his life because a bullet was shot and hit the filter, the, the steel ca can canister of the filter, and say, was lodged in there and saved his life. So multi-purpose. And then, war bonds. You wanted to have everyone know that you were doing your duty. This is 1917. People walked, and they walked if to, let's say, the uh, streetcar. So let's say you had to walk out of your house, go down to the next street, walk over two blocks, and that's where the streetcar was. But it was, a, it was a community of front porches. So what you would do is you would, when you bought a war bond, you, bought a, you got a placard like this, and you would put it in your front window so that everybody who walked by knew that you were doing your duty, that you were participating, that you were not a slacker. So you would show, and you, there are photographs out there of houses that their entire front porch is covered, covered by these. And then, <laughs> let's say you own, there was no Wegmans at the time, there were all these little mom and pop corner stores. And for them to do their patriotic duty, one of them was to stay home and keep their store open, was they sold war stamps. And these war stamps, remember, these were the ones that were in the smaller denominations. So they would put a sign like this out in, in their window, and what they would do is they would put them by the penny candy uh, uh, counter so that when the kids would come in, they would kind of guilt them to buy a nickel's worth of candy and then buy a nickel's worth of, uh, of the stamps for them. And then I, um, <clears throat> here is the phone that I t um, told you about. You can see right here, it's made at um, Strongburg Carlson, made in Rochester, went to France, came back to Rochester. And then here is the map um, that um, Major Couchman from Rochester brought back. Um, and this was an actual battle map of his. And you can come up here and you can look at the top, top of it and it'll tell you when the information was updated. So that means that that was one of the flights that flew over enemy territory, uh, took pictures of it by someone who was trained here in Rochester in the Aerial School of Photography. They landed, they went back to the uh, military map people who updated the maps, and then they were reissued. What they would try to do was do this within a 24-hour turnaround. So you come up here, you can see when, when it was updated, and you can see, note change of color. The enemy, on this map, enemy trenches are in blue. And sometimes they would change them into red or green or orange because they were afraid of that if they were, these maps were captured, perhaps the German who, ca who um, captured it couldn't read English, so he wouldn't know whose trenches they were, sh they were showing. Um, so they would change them. That's what the, uh, the story is behind this. So that's my presentation about Rochester during the Great War. Um, are there any comments or questions? Yes, ma'am. 